It's Tuesday, which means it's talking Science with Brad time. Brad, uh, happy Tuesday. Yeah, it's always a good Tuesday. It was a very eventful week last week as well. Absolutely. There's some f- there's four cracking stories uh, that, that you've brought to show today. The first one, of course, is the SpaceX Falcon Heavy uh, launch, which is a pretty big milestone again. That's right. You know, so this is the, the, the larger version of their rocket. It had its first test back in February last year. Now, the key with the Falcon 9 Heavy is has three of these boosters that are supposed to come back down and land. Uh, last February, only the two side ones did, not the main one. However, uh, last week, uh, all three came back down and landed and essentially touched down perfect uh, rocketry. And it was kind of amazing to see how it all came to be. And it's a pretty cool uh, advancement for SpaceX, uh, even though they're on, the, it was a commercial mission. Yeah, the ArabSat 6, that's right. Uh, so so even while we're while they're doing these commercial missions, they're, they're learning about uh, how to keep making these rockets and, and making them the best that they can be for, for the future. Exactly, because so the, the key with this heavy is that it can get into that geosynchronous orbit, that really high orbit, which is required there's a lot of thrust and a lot of energy. Obviously, they want to use it to take people you know, further afield, but it's really great to see. And yeah, as you said, the more, the more they make and the more reusable they are, the cheaper per launch they, they become. I mean, I think the normal Falcon 9, just the single one, uh, has already reduced costs of up by like 10 to $20 million um, per you know satellite, which is actually a huge amount of money um, for one of these things. Per, per mission, per launch. I mean, that, that that's an incredible saving over the years. Exactly. That's right. You know, you just get so much value out of it. And now that they can send it to extend it to that higher orbit, uh, it's just, it, it really is one of those things where, uh, you know, we talk a lot about it, but, you know, the, the, the savings alone, let alone the technical heart side of it, is quite amazing. From one cheaper mission to a more expensive mission uh, that unfortunately failed in the last couple of days, uh, Israel's attempt to get to the moon. Uh, I mean, they did get to the moon. Unfortunately, they didn't land. That's right. So this was Israel's first attempt at landing on the moon. And as you said, they, they almost got there. It didn't quite make it. So uh, it was actually not only just Israel's first, but it was also the first private mission uh, to land on the moon. So this was a um, result of what was called the Google Lunar Prize. So this was a competition Google ran for the first company to land on the moon that they would have gotten $30 million. That ended actually in December last year. So they just missed the window, but that didn't stop them. And they, as you said, they got pretty much all the way up to, well, they technically did get to the moon. Uh, they just didn't land as soft as they would have liked to, as they say. I love one of the quotes from uh, one of the team that was monitoring the landing sequence, which was, there's a suspicion that we did not land on the moon in the best fashion. We're trying to clarify the matter. I, I think that just sums it up beautifully. Look, and, and it's really, I, you know, there's two things here. It's heartbreaking for them. I mean, they got so close, they had a computer glitch in the last 10 minutes of descent, and that was it. You know, and if, you, if you're not descending at the right ratio, you just go down too fast. However, you know, there's two, there's an important part here. This was a private built mission by Israel and it costs about $200 million, which in terms of lunar missions is dirt cheap. I mean, the fact that they were able to do it for that cost and only, you know, 99%, um, unfortunately, like a marathon, it's the one the last one percent that people remember yeah. uh but you know th- there's no looking down upon the community by them i think there's only applause and encouragement all around that they were able to get this far for what they did and it, they already have said they want to build a second one and are making plans for it and of course the second one should be cheaper than the first because they already know how to do it mm. um and so you know again kudos to them um, it's really sad to see. I was really looking forward to them making a uh, the best possible landing, but as you said, they didn't land in the way they would like. And, of course, that was on a Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, it launched on a Falcon 9 rocket uh, back in late February. So, again, here's, here's SpaceX technology. Um, Paving, paving the way. That's right, and making it cheaper. And, you know, and it wasn't on the heavy, it was on the normal, and that's why it took two months. They could even go on a heavier ride now that they're becoming more and more reliable, and they can make it quicker uh, and to have less possibilities and malfunctions. Well, one place I'd like to get to really quickly is Proxima Centauri. Uh, I believe that they, uh, that astronomers uh, from Italy might have discovered a super-Earth. Yeah, this was announced over the weekend. Proxima Centauri is the nearest star to us. So if you, in the southern skies, if you look towards the South Pole, there's the Southern Cross. 
And the brightest star, what we call the pointers next to is Alpha Centauri. So this is a three-star system. And in there, uh, one of those stars, Proxima Centauri, is currently the closest star to us uh, at 4.2 light years away. And they've, we've known of a, new, a planet around that star already, and now it appears there's a second planet, and this is a, a super Earth, um, which is kind of exciting to find it around our, literally our neighboring star, our neighboring solar system. Now I underwent Exoplanets 101, a little uh, online course to teach me about the four classes of planets that astronomers are classifying out there. Super Earth is at the bigger end of the scale. Uh, Earth analog is obviously very much like our terrestrial Earth. Um, so a super Earth is just a, uh, a bigger Earth? That's right. It is a bigger Earth up to about four times the size of the Earth. Uh, and we still think it's rocky. So the reason we call it a super Earth, it, it doesn't appear to behave or move like one of the gas giants like Uranus or Neptune or, or Saturn even. Uh, and it is still usually relatively close to the star and it appears to be rocky. And the cool thing is super Earths are quite common. Uh, there, we believe that about 20% of all stars host super Earths, which is cool because our solar system doesn't have a super Earth. And so that makes it all the more interesting for studying to figuring out how they come to be, how they can sustain in life and, and those sorts of things. And they've been studying that for a little while, according to uh, some online articles, uh, 17 years worth of data. Yeah, so, you know, the, the trick of usually finding one of these planets is the transit technique or the eclipse. Essentially, you wait for the planet to pass in front of the star. The cool thing is, right, or I guess maybe the troublesome is, in order to really fe realize you have a planet, you need to see the eclipse or the transit three times so you know exactly how big it is in the orbit. So if you want to see something that orbits like an Earth year, you need to at least observe for three years to detect it and to detect it well. If you want something much further away, you need to observe it for much longer. So let's say you're getting somewhere like Jupiter where in a year is, you know, over five years, Earth years. Well, you need to observe it for at least 15 years to see three dips. Um, oh, one of the wow. problems why we're, we haven't really found the faraway planets yet in the solar systems is, you know, imagine uh, Pluto, which, you know, regardless of what you want to call it, you know, it would take 130 years to get around the sun. So you would have to observe it for almost 400 years to see three transits. It just makes it almost unfeasible via this technique. And our last story today, Brad, is uh, the twin study from NASA uh, with Scott Kelly on board the International Space Station for 12 months. Uh, they were also studying his brother Mark uh, to compare some changes in uh, genealogy and, and uh, chromosomes and such forth. Yeah, so, I mean, this is cool. It's, well, kind of, uh, in some ways. Astronauts go through a lot of health problems in space, and one of the big questions is, is it the longer you're in space, the more likely you are to to have problems and how long or how likely you are to, to recover from those problems. And so NASA had a pair of astronaut twins uh, and both astronauts have been in space. And so Scott was chosen to go into space for much longer to see, will he have different problems from his twins? And they had 10 different ways of measuring things. Um, and the answers appear to be yes, the longer you are in space, the more health problems you do have. Uh, however, some of those you do recover, um, but again, it takes a longer time to recover from. And the reason NASA and everyone's interested in this is, you know, right now, the, the quickest we can make a trip to Mars is about three years. So if you have a lot of problems and it takes you a long time to recover from those problems, that might be problematic for those trips to Mars. Now, I'm no geneticist, but uh, I did uh, find it a little interesting that the shields around our chromosomes, the telomeres, they grow longer uh, to protect our chromo or astronauts' chromosomes. Uh, is that interesting? Um, is that sort of, I guess, an, an effect of solar radiation and, and such forth, maybe? Well, so they're trying to figure out the exact source because that is a big deal. But essentially, essentially they're saying, you know, part of the things that make them up are, are changing. That in fact, the twins are almost technically no longer identical twins based on what happened. Um, and that's a really big deal. So in fact, my wife does space medicine. And so she's worked on uh, the Kelly missions, uh, the year long missions. And it's, it really is a big deal because they're trying to find the sources of all these different causes because even simple things, most astronauts are not allowed to drive when they come back to Earth. And that's essentially because the, you know, fluids move differently in space than they do here on Earth because of the lack of gravity. 
and that actually has changes to the eyeballs. There's actually an ultrasound machine on the space station that images every astronaut's eyes because the eyes literally change shape. Um, so these little subtle things are really big deals for, you know, for how people go into space. And one of the, the pressing issues, I think, that uh, people are starting to realize is, you know, all of these studies are, are mostly done on 30 to 50 year old white American males. In the era of private space travel, that's not going to apply. And there's going to be different effects. People have different health problems going in. And, you know, as we were talking about private space travels around the corner and how those people are going to deal with space uh, is a really interesting question and something people need to be prepared for. It's a really interesting study because they they put 10 individual studies together and uh, put it through a blender and came up with a summary paper. And now they're going to go in depth uh, and research more on all of this. Is, is that the way that it's all going to move forward? Yeah, that's right. So essentially they looked at a whole bunch of different ways and they had some broad conclusions. Now they want to look at long-term studies. They also want to look at what some of the other astronauts who have been long in space have looked at and dealt with um, and so it, it is not the end uh, and there's new follow-up experiments they've been doing similar experiments now with mice um, so identically bred mice being left on the space station and on earth to compare how they change fantastic brad well as always thanks for talking science and uh, we'll catch you next week thanks matt